a very warm welcome. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Terry Holloway. I'm the managing director of the Cambridge Aero Club. And it really is a warm welcome on a very cold spring evening to this, our last winter lecture of this last winter. Cambridge Aero Club always has lectures in the winter months to entertain people, to keep club um, membership together. Um, we have a focus on safety and we also try and educate people. And this evening you're going to get a bit of all of those things. This is not the first time Nigel has spoken to us at one of our Aero Club talks, and I promise you, you're in for a real treat. For those of you that don't know Nigel, he's a very accomplished pilot, taught to fly initially by the Royal Air Force at the London University Air Squadron. He has a high-powered job in the city dealing with um, financial fraud, um, but his real love and passion is flying. He's amassed thousands of flying hours, he has an ATPL, and he's owned a wide variety of aircraft. These days, he flies around in a Piper Lance, um, November 101 Delta Whiskey. And this is a sort of advertisement for Nigel. If you put his aircraft registration in on YouTube, you'll find lots of interesting postings he's put on, on YouTube, um, showing various trips he's made. He's made a lot of trips throughout Europe, to Malta, Scandinavia, and of course, the North Atlantic, which is what this evening is about. One or two of us have been lucky enough to fly through Iceland on our way to America, and a few of us on screen tonight are planning to go there on a little trip next year, and I hope that Nigel will encourage you all to fly to Iceland. It's a wonderful place. We're all looking forward to getting back to flying, and before the main event starts, a brief advertisement. The Cambridge Area Club is up and running next Monday. Normal business is being resumed, subject to the COVID precautions um, following this latest lockdown. And we're looking forward to seeing you. The advertisement is, if you want to fly a very nice Airways, fully Airways equipped Cessna 182, the airplane which was previously Robert Marshall's and had a very restricted use, is now available for Aero Club members and other people that want to join the Aero Club and fly it. Anyway, enough of the advertisements, time now for the main event, and over to you, Nigel, you have control. Thank you very much, Terry. And uh, I have to say, I'm absolutely amazed by the attendance tonight. So thank you very much, all of you in advance. I will try to um, try to reward your, your, um, your presence here. Um, so to start with, um, how did I come to be interested in flying to the Faroe Islands and beyond? And the answer actually started in a pub in Kirkwall many years ago, I think 1998, something of that sort. I'd flown up to Kirkwall with some friends of mine, I think four or five different aircraft, and we were staying in a, in a hotel next to a pub. And in the end, we uh, found ourselves sitting around in the pub in the evening, just talking about where people wanted to go flying. And we had in front of us the manual that you can see that I've reproduced in the bottom right hand corner, which is a Jefferson TUK04, which is a sort of starter kit for Jefferson, covering essentially the UK. Most places as you flick through the sheets are obvious. There's places like Sheffield in those days was open. There were places like Heathrow and Gatwick and Birmingham, all the places that you would imagine. And then right towards the back of the book, there's this place which to British ears and eyes at least is Vagar. Absolutely no clue where Vagar was apart from the fact it said in little writing next to it, Faroe Islands. But to be absolutely honest with you, I wasn't really clear where they were either. So it wasn't very enlightening. So, so Vagar it was. And we sort of sat there as a group increasingly after several pints talking to one another about where we might go. And we let it on a plan that we would fly to Vega, having looked them up on the map and decided that actually it seemed quite daring to go all the way to the Faroe Islands. And if you're sitting in Kirkwall, you've already gone halfway there by the time you've flown up from places like Cambridge. So it didn't seem that difficult. So Vega became our very first objective. And this was the setting in a pub not dissimilar to this with this manual sitting in front of us that prompted it all. So just in case like me, you were slightly hazy over exactly where the Faroe Islands are. Here is a handy map. And you'll see immediately that once you get to the uh, north of Scotland, the Orkneys and Kirkwall, pretty close. 
In fact, I think it's only about a five mile sea crossing to get to the Orkneys from the north of Scotland. Shetlands, not too far either. But then beguilingly close, you have the Faroe Islands halfway essentially between the north of Scotland and Iceland. Um, they're not quite on a direct route. If you sort of draw a line from Wick or thereabouts to Iceland, you don't quite fly over the Faroes, but they do represent a sort of a halfway house. And so whether you're thinking about the North Atlantic or thinking about Iceland, the Faroes are interesting as a starting point because almost immediately you're thinking about somewhere that could conceivably be a stopping off point, even for an aircraft with relatively low range. It starts to feel like the North Atlantic is accessible to you. Bit of background on the Faroes. So the Faroes are um, a little bit like the Channel Islands are to us. They're owned by Denmark, but they are independent and have been self-determining since 1946. Um, but the language there in theory is Faroese, but in fact Danish is far more commonly spoken than Faroese. The currency there is the Faroese krona, but it's actually a complete parity to the Danish krona. Everything is Danish essentially there. And in terms of flying there commercially, there are far more flights from places like Copenhagen than there are from anywhere else. You can actually fly there commercially from Edinburgh under happier times, but um, attempts to establish a route between London and the Faroes have pretty much always failed. Um, in terms of the history of the Faroes, though I appreciate that's not what you're all here for, but just to give you a bit of background, the earliest inhabitation of the Faroes is, goes back to about 300 AD. And although there are various stories that date before that, 300 is about the earliest that's been proven. Um, but we were talking really about populations of maybe 50 or 60 in monastic-like situation. The real inhabitation of the pharaohs came in about 900 and predictably was Viking in origin. And in fact, the uh, more than that, rather than being Danes, they were Norwegians. Um, and in fact, it's interesting, if, if you look at the occupation of both the Faroes and Iceland, they both date from around about the same time, around the 900 AD point, as a point at which what we now think of as Denmark and Norway were effectively one country. And those two countries together really formed much of the early history of the Faroes. By the time you got up to the 14th century, Faroes had reached a massive population of 3,000 of which 1,000 were promptly wiped out by Black Death. Um, so in fact, the pharaohs have reached their mighty 55,000 population today, really only very slowly over the course of recent history. Um, they were still effectively run by Norway right up to the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And as some of you may know, um, Norway and Denmark were effectively split apart after the, after the Napoleonic Wars. And it was by that mechanism that the Danes came to control the pharaohs, as well as at that time, Iceland. Moving on to more recent times, the um, thing which allows us even to talk about landing on the pharaohs is the Second World War. You can imagine when the Germans invaded Denmark, there were major concerns that the Germans would find their way quickly to the pharaohs and probably to Iceland, and that could have changed the whole course of the war in terms of the ability to place aircraft and ships in friendly harbours, strategically located right across the North Atlantic. So in 1940, the decision was taken to invade both the Faroe Islands and Iceland and to place troops there throughout the duration of the war. And in fact, it was British troops that built two of the main airports we're going to talk about tonight, both Reykjavik Airport, the city airport that is, and the airport at Vaga on the Faroe Islands. So. The um, Faroe Islands Airport, Vagar, was built in 1942. Reykjavik Airport was built in 1940, both by the Royal Engineers. And in fact, interestingly, the airport at Vagar on the Faroes was used through to 45 and then actually abandoned right the way through to 1963. And it's only been since 63 that it's been opened again for civilian air traffic. And actually, it's, it's gradually grown from what was originally a 1200 metre runway to an 1800 metre runway, which its present extent. And even that development has really been over the course of the last 10 or 11 years. In fact, when it first opened for commercial traffic, they were extremely limited in terms of the kind of aircraft that could land there. Early traffic was mostly things like DC-3s. Um, early jet traffic was things like 146s. 
Um, but now, actually, the uh, based airline there, the Faroes National Airline at Air Atlantic, um, operates um, Airbus A319s on the basis of the current runway. And uh, you can imagine that that's opened up destinations far beyond what was originally possible. So, in fact, in what I think we would call the holiday season now, you even get um, national airline operating trips down to places like Malaga direct, which uh, would have been previously absolutely impossible for them. So if we zoom a little bit in on the Pharaohs, this is what it actually looks like. And it will become immediately apparent to you that the Faroe Islands really lives up to the name. It is an enormous number of individual islands. Different sources count the islands differently, but the consensus is that there are between about 70 and 80 islands that actually make up the Faroe Islands. Um, the capital, Torshafen, you can see there shown right in the middle on the largest island. Um, the airport, and what we're interested in, is on that island immediately to the left, Servagur. Um, you'll see immediately that it used to be the case, and in fact, when I first flew to, to the islands, that actually once you landed, half your journey was still in front of you because getting from one island to another used to take hours. You can see that these days there are a variety of both existing tunnels as well as planned tunnels between the islands. Um, but in those days it was roll on roll off ferries. And if you missed the last ferry, you were stuck on the island that you were on for the day. Um, now there is a tunnel that joins the island that Vega Airport is on, onto the main island. And in fact, to get from the airport by hire car down to Torsaf, and it's probably about an hour and ten's drive, not because it's a particularly lengthy distance. To give you a sense of scale from the airport to Torsaf, and it's probably as the crow flies about 20 nautical miles. Um, but the roads are incredibly windy. They wind around all of the hills and mountains that you can see there, every single one decorated with a tremendously picturesque waterfall. And travel is still something that's conducted at a rather leisurely pace. The other challenge is that the, by far the biggest occupant population of the pharaohs is sheep. And a little bit like Iceland, it has its own breed of horse, which is completely genetically unconnected to other horses. Some of you may have seen it can be identified because it has an unusual gait. The order in which it puts its hooves down when it's running is not like any other horse on the planet. It turns out that um, the Faroe Islands have its very own genetically separate breed of sheep. The joke is on the Faroe Islands that because these sheep seem to have the ability to be on a vertical inclines grazing away, that the special feature of Faroe sheep is that one side of their legs is different length to the other. And it's the only way that they manage to stay upright on the slopes. I think that's a lie. But nonetheless, they look like normal sheep, but somehow they appear to be able to negotiate vertical inclines with no problem at all. The other feature, as you're going to see, is that Faroe sheep really, really love grass. And the Faroese, who are very enterprising, um, build their houses with roofs made out of live lawn. So in fact, if you go to any Faroese native building, you'll see that the roofs are all covered in grass. And it's not uncommon to drive past and find that there's a couple of sheep sitting on your roof, um, grazing your lawn down, ensuring your roof doesn't become overgrown. Um, truly, truly unique. The other unique feature about the Faroes is the bird population, which again has relevance for those of us who don't like flying through crowds of birds. Um, the Faroese offer protect, protected status to enormous numbers of colonies of particularly seabirds, um, things like petrels, for example. But I think the largest population are the puffins, which in the local language is Lundi or Lundi, um, from where we have Lundi Island, for example. Lundi is a puffin. And uh, there are thousands and thousands of them on the island. And uh, again, enterprising that they are, the Faroese, when they get bored of eating fish, which is the main diet, eat puffins. Um, and I can tell you that puffins taste an awful lot like fish, um, served in a rather treacly brown sauce that the Faroe, Faroe Islanders love. Um, so Faroe is a really exciting place, very, very different um, from almost anywhere else you will have seen anywhere you land on the planet. Um, but its climate leaves an awful lot to be desired. And as we're going to see, this is a major feature in terms of flight planning. Before we pass on, I've put the, um, the uh, 
Jefferson plate here for the airport. Very unremarkable if you just look at the picture. It's a straight line with a terminal building and one taxiway exit. This plate's more interesting by the small print, which if you're quick off the mark, you don't necessarily read. The one which surprised me, which I hadn't properly read, was the first comment, runway grooved. As you can imagine, there is quite heavy snowfall many times of the year in, uh, in the Faroe Islands, and frequently the runway is contaminated with ice. And in order to provide some form of braking action, they cut very, very deep grooves into the runways. Not like the grooves you, you feel if you land at places like Gatwick or Heathrow or Luton, really, really deep grooves. What you might not anticipate then is when you land on Vega, it feels like you're landing with flat tires. The noise is deafening. Uh, and the first time I landed, I assumed that I'd burst my two main gear because the noise just felt like it and the, and the braking action felt like I was braking on flat tires. Um, so a lesson, if ever there was one, that um, it's very worthwhile reading this stuff on the Jefferson charts. So they don't just put it there for fun. Um, but it's hidden away somewhere where you might not necessarily see it. The other for IFR pilots, it's interesting to point out, is if you look right down at the takeoff minima, and you'll come to appreciate this in a moment when we look at the approaches to the runways, you will see that even departing IFR, there's a requirement to be able to see a couple of named islands and the terrain around the climb out slope. As you're going to see very, very shortly, this is because the terrain around the airport is remarkable. It's basically in the bottom of quite a deep valley with curving approaches to it. The reason for that's interesting as well, because there are flatter places on the islands they could have built this airport. But the reason they built it where they did was because they didn't want it to be detected by passing German warships. So by tucking the airport away where it can't be seen between rocks, you can't actually see the airport from any angle from the sea, which is fantastic if you're planning to repel a German invasion, not so good if you're planning to land your aircraft there. So with that out of the way, this is a, a very low quality Google map, but I chose it because it provides a sense of what the airport and terrain looks like. So the airport, uh, you can see down here, the gray strip. And if you were to sort of trace with your mind's eye, straight line approaches in either direction, Heading towards the northwest, you immediately see that actually a straight line would take you into those rather remarkable cliffs to the north of the inlet. And likewise, a straight line heading out towards the southeast quickly runs you into terrain by sort of where the two number 11s are. So what you're left with is effectively this sort of what I term a banana shaped lake, which I suppose you could cross and fly along and then hang a left and land. And you've also got this inlet, um, which you can more or less follow down, but perhaps not in a straight line in order to uh, get to the runway. Um, the offset nature of the approach is such that even before RNP approaches had been designed, there were localized DME approaches in both directions, but both of them were offset so that you effectively are not flying directly onto the runway. And the consequence was that you'd have minima typically around 500 feet, 550 feet. So they weren't actually much help if you wanted to get in in very, very low cloud conditions. Um, these days they have designed RNP approaches which allow you to get down to about 250 feet, providing you're suitably equipped. Um, but it's still a fairly brave approach to pull off in cloud. And most people arriving in light air would, would aircraft would rather come in visually, even if it means not following an instrument approach, ducking down low whilst over the sea, and then following the banana shaped lake up to land on the predominant runway. Um, the winds, as you'll appreciate, coming across the Atlantic tend to blow west to east. And as they hit the Faroe Islands, they tend to be sort of 300, 310, that kind of direction. So runway 31. Um, tends to be the runway which is predominantly in use. Um, so again, approaching via the banana-shaped lake, flying up and hanging a left when you see the approach lights is considered a, a reasonable option. So this is the approach. Um, it's actually 3-0 now, but um, you can see immediately the point. If you were to take off and fly straight ahead, um, unless you've got some serious climb performance, you're going to come to grief about a minute and a half after departure. 
So the instructions are pretty much take off, turn left and follow the water out. And if you can't see the water, um, then you have a problem. Likewise, the, um, the instrument departure minima that you saw referred to on the previous chart refers to that little headland that you can just see poking in top left. That headland is actually a separate island and you need to be able to see that island in order to make an IFR departure from the airfield. So this is the approach you're most likely to see and the water you can see immediately in front of you is the top of what I refer to as the banana shaped lake. Um, and you can see immediately why conventional instrument approaches don't really work there. So here's your other option. This is looking down runway one, two. Once again, you can see this, this inconveniently placed chunk of rock right in the face of you as you attempt to either, you can see the, the instrument approach in or trying to climb away. That uh, piece of rock is called Koltor and is home to 500 sheep and no people. Um, but it also contains the wreckage of a number of aircraft, which no one can find the economic reason to remove. So it's there as a warning, should you uh, contemplate doing anything brave. The RNP approach, looking inbound to this runway, um, effectively wins its way around those rocks. So what you're looking at there, you can almost visually trace um, where the approach comes in and you can see why it's offset. In fact, you can't quite see it on this photo, but in the car park are the localizer needles or the localizer ra um, radio antenna. So there is a whole area of the car park that can't be used to avoid cars from obstructing the localizer. Um, first time I think I've ever encountered an ILS sensitive zone that's not actually on the airport. So, Given quite how unpleasant the approaches are both on to three zero and one two, um, what about the other option, the, the, um, the banana shaped lake? Well, this is what the approach looks like from there. So what you're looking at, the lower water with all those interesting waves in them is the sea. And above that is the actual lake, which has a permanent waterfall um, where the lake is constantly emptying into the sea. Um, as you can see, that, that kind of cloud base is a typical cloud base for a good day um, in the islands. And as a result, you'll see that the top of terrain is pretty much covered. So your choice of coming in this kind of level, the sort of level that this photo is shot at, which is about 600 AGL, something of that sort, is not a bad choice. Because on a day when you may not feel like braving it coming through the clouds, particularly if you don't do that many RMP approaches or you just don't fancy chancing your arm, um, an approach which is perfectly VMC under VFR along the lake, essentially following the middle of the lake round onto the runway is actually quite tempting. It's also a beautiful view. I mean, I think the waterfalls here vary in their intensity from time of year, but uh, this would be a fairly typical sort of low waterfall period. I think this was shot in May um, but occasionally you see water thundering over that entire length um, and it really is an impressive sight and as a pilot you always want to carry someone with you, you can actually take a shot of it because it's one of the many, many impressive sights of the islands. So what you're looking at there is the, um, the entrance to the lake shown by the red circle at the bottom. So I've sort of softened you up slightly in terms of the, the easier options for going there and how to, how to make your approach. How about the actual route itself? So I'm starting with the premise that we start on Kirkwall, if only because for historic reasons, that's where I started my journey from. What I've done though, is I've shown what the direct route looks like in nautical miles from each of a number of obvious other contenders. We'll come back to the subject of WIC, but um, WIC is actually not a bad choice at all. Um, Kirkwall just happens to be, as you can see, about the closest. Lerwick, as, as this diagram comes close to showing, whilst it is a shorter hop, takes you somewhat out of your way to the east um, before you actually go back. So in terms of overall mileage, if you can bear effectively adding another eight miles to your journey, going from Kirkwall is probably a better option. Kirkwall is also good because it has reasonably unobstructed approaches and instrument approaches as well. 
So that in the event you need to come back and the weather's descended, you have options for getting in. Um, so looking at the journey then, 227 nautical miles, that doesn't sound too bad, but bear in mind that at around 5,000 feet, a typical wind would be on the nose about 20 to 25 knots. Um, sometimes stronger, sometimes less, obviously. But if you're sitting, sitting there thinking of maybe an 105 knot cruise or 110 knot cruise, think again, you're probably looking at 80 knots over the ground. So what you don't have is the option to go typically all the way to the Faroe Islands in a 172, only to discover you can't land and then come back again. Admittedly, you'll have the tailwind on the way back, but there is a point of no return with this journey for many smaller aircraft, unless you're lucky enough to be able to carry significant fuel and or you're capable of faster flight. But this is the sort of setting the problem out bare. In terms of airspace and routings, as you see, I've annotated this, this box, which uh, occupies most of the screen as the Scottish FIR. Scottish FIR helpfully is class G all the way up to flight level 245. You can fly whatever route you like. So there's absolutely nothing to stop you flying the very most direct route you can. So even though this looks like the kind of naive route you first draw when you first plot a route to an airport, this is actually the route that you're perfectly able to fly. And you can fly it at any altitude you like, really. Um, radio coverage isn't much of an issue on this particular leg. If you're at around flight level five zero, you will never come out of the HF coverage. Um, the reason for that is that Scottish have coverage from, your, from both the Orkneys and from the Shetland Islands. Um, Iceland radar, sorry, Iceland radio rather, which is a in-flight information service, um, also has coverage both from um, radio transmitters on the south of the Faroe Islands, as well as radio transmitters on, I believe, the Shetland Isles. Um, so you are able to talk to someone right across the route. So typically, you'll talk to Scottish information, which many of you will appreciate, is also able to provide radar service. So you are as good as talking to IFR controllers. And they can provide that coverage pretty much right the way up to the edge of the FIR boundary. It didn't come out very well on this full flight map, which I've reproduced, but some of you may be able to work out there's a, there's a dotted circular zone around the Faroe Islands. This is um, known as the Faroe's TIZ, it's traffic information zone. Didn't used to be, but these days it's a radio mandatory zone and a transponder mandatory zone. Um, they don't stipulate what kind of transponder, so in principle, mode A will do, but you do have to have it switched on and um, they are interested in knowing where you are. That said, the Vega air traffic controllers are FISOs in our terminology. So whilst they have a terminal monitor, which allows them to see incoming transponding traffic, um, they are not able to offer you vectors. Um, everything is procedural. And likewise, if you're VFR, everything is about position reporting. You report, for example, a beam in the smallest of the uh, southernmost islands, and you will then report with your estimate for Vegar itself and what your intended routing is. So the good news is that in terms of radio work, everything's very easy. And in terms of your routing, a straight line works perfectly well because no one's there to tell you otherwise. What's less good, as you will have spotted perhaps, is that once you get to that northernmost boundary of the Scottish FIR, you enter the Reykjavik CTA, which you can think of as, as effectively an FIR. It's, it's not functionally a terminal control area. Um, but most importantly, it's class A airspace above flight level 55. And that is a problem because there are no exceptions to VFR traffic being in that airspace. So if you wish to go VFR or you're required to go VFR to the Faroes, at least for that last bit, you need to come down to 5,400 or flight level 54 or below. And that's the point at which some people get cold feet because whilst it's easy to convince yourself somehow that you're gliding clear from something if you're doing this at flight level 100, it sort of feels a bit more real if you're forced down to a lower level because of controlled airspace above you. The reality is, of course, you're not going to be at any level able to glide clear. So it's kind of false, false safety. 
Um, but it's worth saying this is perfectly doable VFR. I've done it VFR, many have done it VFR. You just need to be aware that whatever altitude arrangements you make in the Scottish FIR, you're going to be down, you need to be down below 5.5 five, um, for that last chunk. And during that time, you will not be in anybody's radar cover. Um, and that, that may, for some people, present a sufficient enough risk to, to warn them off. Um, there is nowhere you can reasonably land on those southernmost islands in the Faroes. In fact, when you look at them, they really do look like huge lumps of basalt, which is substantially what they are. And if you were to attempt to put down on them, they're more likely to tear the bottom of your fuselage open than they are to do anything good for you. So it's one of those interesting games that people tend to play is you're flying along there saying, well, if the engine failed now, would I go for the water where it's freezing cold and where I may drown? Or will I, will I try and put down on whatever flat piece of land I can in the knowledge that this is really nasty, bouldery land where I'm going to do myself a lot of damage? It's a, it's a difficult one. And I, I would say that probably second only to the water crossing, the sense that the terrain is somewhat inhospitable seems to be the um, the uh, the two reasons why people will tend to either defer or or not undertake a journey of this sort. But for those who are not put off by this, um, the solace I would offer, particularly if you are going VFR, is that because the headwinds are so strong, typically you do not want to go up at flight level 100 just because you can. Um, typically, this is a journey where actually there's plenty of benefit to doing it VFR, um, enjoy lower headwinds. And actually, from the point of view of the Scottish controllers, you're pretty much under the same radar coverage right the way up to the FIR boundary anyway. So there are very few reasons why you would do this IFR uh, unless you, for some reason, felt you had to make an IFR approach into the Faroes. Most people, I think, when looking at alternates for planning of this flight, will tend to look at, at uh, the Shetlands as an alternate. Again, good instrument approaches. Um, and by the time you've got towards the Faroes, if you decide to turn around, it's slightly closer to go back into Lua, into uh, into Sumbra rather, than it is to go all the way back to Kirkwall. Um, but those kind of considerations apart, you can see this is not a difficult journey. It really is a question of can you fly on a straight line for however long it takes you to cover the 227 nautical miles. So we talked a little bit about the weather. Um, when I was preparing this talk a couple of days ago, you can see by the date actually the third on this, I just, no, no cheating, I simply pulled what the current Met are and the TAF was at the time. And actually they're pretty, they're pretty um, representative, I would say. So looking at, looking at the Vega Meta, um, you can see already 290, not at all untypical, 10 knots, 5,000 meters. Mist comes and goes a lot on the islands. It rolls down the hills and then disappears as quickly as it arrives. So 5,000 are broken at 600 feet, not at all uncommon. If you were flying ILS approach, oh, sorry, a, yeah, a, a localizer DME approach onto the island, you'd be pretty much at minima flying the instrument approach. But you saw my picture a little earlier of the approach up the banana shaped lake, 500 feet, 400 feet, that would be a perfectly reasonable approach. So once again, it's, it's um, a mistake to assume that necessarily doing this IFR is actually a better option. And on a day like this, leaving aside for a moment interpreting the uh, TAF, but if we just take the METAR at face value for a moment, this is a good case in point where content, potentially a VFR approach is going to serve you better. Looking at the TAF again, you, you can see to a certain extent what I'm on about here. Um, drizzle, low cloud, varying visibility, um, the constant being winds somewhat from the north to northwest. That's pretty much what you come to expect. Um, and the other thing is gusting. And it'll be no surprise to anybody looking at that terrain. The, it's the terrain really which triggers the gusts. Different wind directions, as you'll appreciate, are more favorable from a gust point of view than others. But uh, the prevailing situation is that you will arrive in fairly turbulent air. So once again, I showed you that idyllic picture of the banana shaped lake and the approach there. But what it was really like on that day was really quite gusty. And it's a tribute actually to the chap that took the photo, quite how smooth he made it look, because we were working quite hard um, right the way through the approach. 
it does tend to settle down the last 100 feet or so, but um, both departures and arrivals into the pharaohs tend to put off passengers who aren't perhaps, um, let's say, comfortable flyers. Um, you can predict a degree of turbulence with, with monotonous regularity. Um, the diagram I've reproduced on the right-hand side, again, was just to show vari variation during the day. Um, so again, you'll see it's being classified as IFR conditions, largely because the predicted vis during the day is, is predicted to be low. And interestingly, if you look down at the wind speeds, they start at 3, 4, 5, 24, gusting 36, 3, 4, 6, 24, gusting 36. You look along the line there, and that is pretty representative of wind conditions for the island. And you'll see supreme irony. Of course, you get to 1800 Zulu, and um, suddenly we become a VFR with a 4,100 foot ceiling and 16 um, kilometers vis, and um, the winds remain 348, 19 gusting, 29 knots. So they tend not to be crosswinds, but they tend to be gusting 10, 20 degrees off the runway. And uh, you'll see varying precipitation this time of year, plenty of, of sleet and snow. Um, I would say things generally improve by around May time. And May through to August is really quite pleasant. And although it's not what you'd call hot, um, most of the precipitation is gone. And you're, you're looking at sort of drizzly showers from time to time, but none of the kind of nasty stuff that you associate with this time of year. It's for this kind of reason that people who are ferrying smaller aircraft across the Atlantic who need to use Vegar as a stepping off point because they're not tanked or because they uh, various other weight range restrictions tend to want to schedule those flights for the warm months in the year because if Vegar is your bolt hole, you don't really want your bolt hole to be covered in snow and go IFR at the last minute. So weather and weather planning is important. And I think the day that uh, my colleagues and I finally launched to Vegar from Kirkwall, um, we actually ended up turning around and coming back on the first shot and spending an additional night in Kirkwall. And I think if you go in with that mindset, you're not going to be disappointed. I think if you if you have to, for work commitments or other, necessarily have to be there on a particular date, on a particular time, it, it may not be the place for you other than during those very warm months in the summer. Um, other things to think about. So um, that's me, uh, not actually on the ferry. This is actually, um, I think, in Goose Bay. But a, a reminder to me to tell you about survival suits. Um, one of the ways that people get comfortable with a lot of cold water in that crossing is to wrap themselves up in rather fetching blobby suits. Um, these are complete dry suits. In other words, once you zip them up and do the seals up, if you go into the water, your skin doesn't come into contact with water, at least not the, most, not the majority of your body. These are in contrast to wetsuits or other forms of survival gear you might use. Um, you can buy one for the princely sum of between three, four hundred pounds, depending on quite what spec you're looking for. But most people will actually rent them. And a company that I do recommend is based in Wick, Far North Aviation. If you look them up, I think they're farnor.com. Um, Far North Aviation has been going um, for a long time now, and they're very much a mandatory stop off for the transatlantic crowd. But the particular deal they do is you if, imagine you're going westbound for a moment, they will allow you to pick up your survival gear, which might include the kind of raft you can see here, kind of blobby suits, flares and similar sort of paraphernalia that might make you more comfortable going across the Atlantic. Um, and they allow you, particularly if you're going all the way, to drop them off in Goose Bay, enjoy your American holiday, and then come back and pick them up again from Goose Bay. And you only pay for the rental for the period of time you've actually used them, rather for the dead time. They don't quite do that for you if you're going to Iceland. But again, if you do call in at Wick on the way up, pick up this kind of gear, and then drop it off on again on your way home, um, it's remarkably cost effective. So unless you plan to do this on a regular basis, Renting a raft, renting a survival gear might well be the right answer for you. And uh, Far North pretty much has the monopoly on that market and their, their pricing is pretty good. I don't get any kickbacks, but um, they are very pleasant people and they've uh, looked after me on many occasions in the past. Um, the other consideration is around insurance. I, I've only used Visicover here because I've used them in the past for this. 
certainly Visicover policies and many policies issued by the other sort of big brokerages, um, all pretty much to a man cover the pharaohs. So if you check your policy details carefully, most of you who've got European coverage, for example, will find the pharaohs are already there. And in fact, you'll also find Iceland is often on there. In the case of Visicover, they have sort of a basic coverage, which includes nothing in Europe. They are Europe 1 and Europe 2. Both Iceland and the Faroes are in Europe 2, which is typically a relatively small additional coverage. What you don't have to do is to arrange sort of trip coverage like you do for traveling across Greenland, for example. It's all considered to be part of Europe, even though neither the Faroes nor Iceland are in the EU. It's all part of, from an insurance point of view, the same European blob. So chances are, if you check carefully, you will not need additional cover, but it's just worth your while making sure that that's the case with your own policy. Certainly, I would not expect to pay any significant premium for doing this journey, but do check. So a little hint of some of the things you can do when you land. So this is Danish heritage, really. The Danes are very, very fond of painting their roofs these beautiful colours, and you could be forgiven for believing you were in Copenhagen looking at this picture. And this Danish, or strictly speaking, Norwegian Danish influence spans right across from the Faroes through to Iceland, right the way through, actually, into Greenland as well. This kind of multicoloured housing is your dead giveaway that you are somewhere that the Danes colonised in one form or another. This picture you can see the main screen is Torshaven, the harbour in Torshaven, um, which is the capital I mentioned earlier. Torshaven's a beautiful little town. Um, it's one of those places which is either blighted by or served by, depending on how you look at it, cruise ships. So from time to time, a cruise ship will come in and double Torshaven's population. Um, the locals kind of love it because it's money. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can imagine what that does in terms of filling all the bars. So if you're very cunning, probably before you plan your trip, you actually look to see whether there are any cruises scheduled into there and probably seek to avoid them, because that way you can wander around without hearing any foreign voices and you can be the exclusive foreigner on the island. Um, Danish is a language which is spoken there, but as you can imagine, disappointingly for linguists, they, um, they speak fluent English pretty much um, without a flaw and any attempts to practice your Danish will be politely corrected in English. Um, but it is a fantastic place to go. Like a lot of the Nordic countries, um, they have some rather strange rules around alcohol, which anybody who's been to Sweden and Norway will also recognise, which is that the importation of alcohol into the country is actually a monopoly. It's a state-sanctioned monopoly, but it is a private company that does it. And you cannot buy alcohol other than through either shops that are effectively outposts of the company concerned or through the relatively small number of licensed bars that there are. And this was originally a reaction to, to public drunkenness. Um, they pretty much got that under control. And the, unfortunately, it means alcohol is relatively expensive. So I think my last visit it worked out at something like £8.50 a pint um, for a pint of the local beer. There are two competing beers on the Faroe Islands, the most famous of which is called Feroza Pure, um, which is served absolutely everywhere. It's a lagery style um, drink. Uh, I have to be honest and say it's kind of unremarkable. If it, it's, it's a lager, you would recognise it. Um, more recently, though, a competitor brewery has opened up, which also has to sell its wares exclusively through the state monopoly. And that, um, that beer is more of a kind of craft beer feel about it. And in fact, they do a variety of colours and flavours. I haven't yet been to the Faroes since that operation opened. So I'm looking forward to going back and trying that out. Um, but apparently by those who have tasted it, really, really well worthwhile. Um, there's loads of walking to do around Torshaf. And because everywhere is on a hill, um, it's perhaps not suitable for those that don't fancy walking up hills. But the views are quite stunning of the harbour if you walk out above it. And um, as you can see, the opportunities to take um, boats out either into the inland waters of the Faroe Islands or out into the sea are really well worth taking. As you can imagine, though, the waters around the Faroes are not the calmest. So again, 
if you have a landlubber with you that is not keen on being bounced up and down in a boat, maybe drinking the beer and looking out to sea is the right answer. But if you do get the chance to go onto a boat, highly recommended, not least because you get to see the sort of cliffs that you've been flying over from sea level and the scale of them becomes really apparent, as you can imagine, if you're sitting in a little boat. The other thing, particularly if you're into wildlife, is the first thing you get to see the sheep doing their one leg longer than the other trick. Down, you find it absolutely impossible to understand how sheep could have possibly got to where they've got to, but they're there and they don't need rescuing. They are just happy in their own little way. Um, the other thing you see, though, is seabirds in an enormous volume. And for those that are interested in, um, in seabirds, it's an unbridled opportunity to see breeds you simply don't see in any kind of number. Um, and so going to see what are known as the bird cliffs, which are actually quite close to the airport, are very, very well worthwhile outings. The other thing for which the Faroe Islands is actually somewhat notorious is the herding and killing of large numbers of whales each year. Um, it's a tradition, but um, not a tradition for which they are particularly popular, that Faroese fishermen um, will actually go out and uh, migrating pilot whales pass by the Faroe Islands at the same sort of time each year. And the Faroese fishermen drive them into some of the harbours that you will have seen as you look at the, um, look at the maps I showed earlier, and effectively beach the whales where they're slaughtered. Um, pictures of it are not for the um, weak stomach, um, but genuinely whale meat and blubber is a very, very much a staple part of the Faroese diet. Um, it's not a sport, it is done for food and it's done once a year and you're, you will often find yourself eating preserved whale that's from the previous year's drive. Um, the corollary is though that there are plenty of places where you can get on a boat and go and see whales without the need to kill them. So actually, again, if you fancy going out and seeing whales, they are breathtakingly close um, and uh, thoroughly recommended. You can see at the top the uh, kind of grass roof I was referring to earlier. Again, it's not uncommon to come across a little hut like that in the middle of nowhere with three sheep on them. And you look around and you think, how did the sheep get on top of the hut? Um, it's not obvious. There are no steps. There are no sort of nearby cabins to jump up onto. Turns out that the one trick that the Faroe sheep have learned is to jump, and they jump really well. Um, so that jumping onto the roof of the cabin you can see on the top right of that picture is well within their means. Because um, these cabins feature everywhere from when the Faroese were slightly more populated than they are now, um, it's not uncommon to find on different islands of the Faroes completely abandoned villages. But for whatever reason, there is still sheep on these essentially unpopulated islands um, with these sort of old dilapidated cottages on them. And the reason that the sheep are allowed to work in that way is that actually, rather than the sheep being sheared by farmers in the field like we would imagine, what happens is that a couple of times a year, the Faroese farmers go in boats to the islands where their flocks of sheep are located as a sort of communal thing. They gather the sheep, they net them in fact, and they put them in boats and they bring them back to the main island here where they're either slaughtered or, or uh, they're trimmed as appropriate. And in fact, the way the community works, you don't have your sheep as such, you have an allotment of sheep. And when the sheep are all brought back, you get a proportion that suits your allotment. And people can buy bigger or smaller allocations of sheep, but that is the way it works. So everybody has a communal interest in bringing as many sheep as they can back in from the islands, dealing with them and then taking them back out to the islands, those that have survived the process. So really unusual thing, you can see a lot of this happening. Um, you can imagine the festivals that are associated with this are of sort of a Viking character. Um, so most times of the year, it seems as a festival of some sort or another that's worthwhile celebrating. So um, awful lot to see and do, um, not without its hazards getting there. Um, for that reason, ferry pilots who are accustomed to the route will tend to skip the Faroe Islands in favour of going direct to Iceland, simply because the weather is so unpredictable on the Faroes, you don't necessarily want to find yourself caught out by it. But I would strongly advocate it as a destination in its own right. I think if you're not out there trying to save yourself money and you're therefore looking for the shortest route across the Atlantic, um, the Faroes are a brilliant destination. They just require a little care in the planning 
and perhaps a decent sense of choosing the right time of year to, to make your move. So moving on from the Faroes, a remarkably similar but larger place. This is Reykjavik. Um, no prize for guessing who populated Iceland and who designed the houses there. So you could be forgiven your believing in an upscaled part of Tolthaven. Um, so Reykjavik, um, the word Vik in Icelandic means a bay. So this is the Bay of Reykja, Keflavik, which you may also be familiar with, is the Bay of Kefla. So Iceland is itself uh, effectively an enormous collection of different bays, each of which have names ending in Vik. Reykjavik just happens to be the capital. Um, and the airport we're going to talk about in a moment that uh, I'm primarily advocating flying to is Reykjavik's own city airport. So for those whose geography a little bit like mine was a few years ago, Iceland is a little bit on the sketchy side. Here's the island and here are some of the airports that you might be interested in. So we'll start off with the obvious ones over on the west side of the island. Reykjavik Airport itself, right in the centre of Reykjavik City. When you land, you land right over the top of the city. Um, you could not be closer and it's easy walking distance into the town centre. Um, Keflavik is the one that everybody thinks of, particularly if they're flying commercially into Iceland. Keflavik's got much longer runways, but it's got both airports have got instrument approaches, so no issues from that point of view. Um, the main thing about Keflavik is that it really is designed to deal with jet traffic, um, by which I mean heavy transport jets. For example, Avgas availability can be a little sketchy there. Um, it's very much oriented towards Jet A1 burners. It's also, as you can probably see by this map, some way out of Reykjavik. So in fact, taking a, a car from Keflavik into Reykjavik, just to give you a sort of sense of timing and scale, you're looking at about 45 minutes to an hour maybe a little more. Um, and uh, so for most people, the convenience of being in the city from the point to which you land outweighs any runway length considerations or things of that sort. So when you look at those people who are around you when you've landed at Reykjavik, you're going to be surrounded by Gulfstreams, Falcons and business jets. It's not just little piston singles going in there. It's perfectly capable of dealing with bigger services. Also of interest, particularly if you're going to do a little bit of gentle tourism on Iceland, is that at Reykjavik Airport, there is an aero club with uh, plenty of 172s for hire, a few PA-28s as well. And those, that fleet is available certainly until very recently, at a very, very reasonable price. So if you fly your own pride and joy in there, but you want to go into some of the shorter strips of which I'm going to show you a picture shortly around the island, then actually, um, the flying into Reykjavik puts you right where the flying school is and renting an aircraft from where you've just landed is just fantastic. The other nice thing about it is that there is an airport, um, an airport hotel, I should say, just 50 yards away from where you've landed at the handling agent. So in fact, even the tiredest pilot can stagger out of their aircraft, stagger across a road and into the, uh, the check-in area of their airport hotel. And it really is almost too easy. So lots and lots of reasons why I would always advocate Reykjavik. It's also true that the handling costs are much lower at Reykjavik too. So given that we all fly expensive hobby aircraft, but we're all trying to save a fast buck on the handling, the handling is much cheaper at, uh, at Reykjavik. Now then, having dealt with the two sort of obvious airports, I did want to suggest two others. And the reason for that will become clear in a moment. At Kureyri, is, as you can see, right at the north of the island. Um, I'll show you pictures in a moment of it. But um, for the time being, the thing to bear in mind is, though it's difficult to perceive on this map, um, it's actually closer to England, to Scotland, I should say, than either Reykjavik or Keflavik. So in fact, flying direct, say, Kirkwall Akureyri, um, as you can see here, um, 583 miles to Akureyri, 626 to uh, Reykjavik. So not only is it useful to know that, but secondly, it's got an ILS, RMP approaches, very long runway, radar. Um, it's an extremely well-equipped airport. So on the basis that you can never be too short of alternates, it's a great alternate to be aware of. Most people who are not familiar with Iceland will never have heard of it, but it's a huge airport and, and an underappreciated asset, definitely one to have in your back pocket. 
it's true to say that the weather in Reykjavik and Keflavik tend to go as a job lot. So if, Ke if Keflavik goes down, Reykjavik pretty much goes down. Whereas Akureyri is an entirely different part of the island and rarely does a whole lot go down in one go, certainly not in an unpredicted sort of way. Um, which takes us to Hoffen, which is actually a, a local abbreviation for a longer name, Horner Fjorda, um, which is not quite a fjord, but not certainly not in the um, in the Scandinavian sense. But Horner Fjord, I've pointed out because it's the runway that's closest to the UK. Um, so if you look at Hoffen from Vega, 254 miles, which is not really that far. You know, on that basis, if you are routing from Kirkwall, you really have made the stop pretty much at the halfway point by going to the Faroes. And it's another relatively short hop to get to Hoffen. And from Hoffen to Reykjavik is all over land if you wish it to be. So if you are going to do this VFR, and the flight level 55 restriction continues as you go north of the um, of the uh, Faroe Islands, Hoffen is probably your place. Um, Hoffen, Keflavik, Reykjavik and Ekureri all have customs on demand, four hours prior notice required. So however unlikely you can appear in Hoffen, which really is a three horse town, um, but there are customs there. So you know, the, the stereotypical private pilot who wants to go there and they're flying a, a Piper Archer or they're flying a 172 or something of this sort, this is a perfectly doable journey. Once again, you've just breached an awful lot of sea at flight level 5.4. Um, how you feel about that is, is a very, very personal decision. I'm not going to try and persuade anybody one way or the other. But if you've made it to the Faroes, you can kind of make it to Iceland. And although it's not in scope for this evening, Actually, there's a route that goes from Reykjavik to Greenland, which is 300 nautical miles as well. So if you want to continue to fly across the Atlantic in your untanked PA-28, you can do it. So having talked a little bit about where things are, so you've got your orientation, here is what a direct route looks like. So this is the 254 nautical miles from Vegar. I've cheated, it's a straight line, so I mean, clearly you want to fly around a couple of rocks, but it's of the order of 260 nautical miles, including fiddling around in circuits. Um, the airspace, as I noted earlier, it's the same CTA that's at class A, 55 or above. I suspect, and I've heard all sorts of reports, that it's utterly unpleased. Um, so no one would kind of know if you were at flight level 100 in that, and you do hear bravado stories of people doing that. But um, if we're going to talk about doing this properly, um, if you're VFR, no problem at all, but you have to be below flight level 55. Um, which takes us briefly into that intriguing triangle of just after halfway through the journey, which is actually the oceanic airspace, um, which is the same airspace in which the North Atlantic track system operates that all of our large jet airliners follow going across the Atlantic you're actually once again below flight level 55 outside the track system. So there's no particular clearance required to fly through that. Um, so even though there's a, there's a piece of airspace, you are, it, it's effectively, you can think of it as an extension of the Reykjavik CTA. Once you get to the inner blue ring, you're in what's called the Reykjavik domestic CTA. And that is class E, which in the Icelandic interpretation is the same as the way we interpret class E, by which I mean, if you're VFR, it's uncontrolled. You need no clearance to be in it as a VFR flight. Um, so contrary to what some people imagine, you don't have to be below a thousand feet in order to be out of that airspace. If you're VFR, you can be in it without a problem, right the way up to, I think it is actually altitude 5,500 at this particular point. Um, and above that is class A, um, if you're coming in IFR, the chances are you're going to be above that 5.5, in which case you're in class A anyway. But just to complete the class A picture, it was class E picture rather, if you are IFR, you do require a clearance to enter class E, which Iceland can give you. Once again, even at flight level 5.4, you are in constant VHF contact between uh, the Faroe Islands and Iceland. And indeed, if you've gone the direct route from Kirkwall to Bravo India Hotel November, often here, you are also in direct contact, not always with a controlling authority, often with Iceland radio, which is essentially the same as London information. 
They can amend flight plans. They can get you IFR clearances. They can update your arrival time and things of this sort, but they can't tell you to do anything. Um, and they will occasionally have you squawk a conspicuity squawk, um, but it's more for the benefit of airliners and others with TCAS in the system than it is because they're actually controlling you. Um, you'll see also then these purple triangles. So the purple triangles that you see there are military training areas. For the most part, they're operating when they're operating above flight level 55. So actually are of no consideration to you if you're VFR and if you're IFR, you'll be routed around them anyway. Um, but just occasionally, um, very, very occasionally, they can be active down to sea level. When that happens, you're effectively forced to fly up the corridor um, towards the sort of plus sign that's directly above my direct distance box. Um, I've worked it out that's 303 nautical miles. So although it feels like it would be a pain, it's not a massive difference in terms of the miles you would actually need to fly. Worth saying also that um, although it looks like it would be a long way to fly from Hoffen up to Akureyri, if you were to be for some reason unable to land at Hoffen, there are a number of smaller airports along that southern coast. So in absolute extremis, you could coordinate a landing there and you'd have to wait for customs to come and sort you out. Um, but the Icelandics are extremely encouraging to general aviation and they don't want someone dying. And if the right thing to do means landing somewhere different, because that's what it, what it means, then they're extremely accommodating and their, their radio is of very high quality. And you'll find that air traffic are as accommodating as it's possible to be. So that's what a VFR route looks like. Just for completeness sake, this is the standard IFR routing from Kirkwall up to Reykjavik. Even though you can see Keflavik on the map, that's just an artifact because I've actually routed to next door Reykjavik. So this is a route to Burk, Bravo India Romeo Kilo, which is the rather ornate um, four-letter designator for Reykjavik. So a few comments on this. Um, to the extent that most of us are flying unpressurized aircraft, and to the extent that we're in class G airspace in the Scottish FIR right the way up to the FIR boundary, there really is no reason why you can't fly a direct route. It's one of these Euro control oddities that this route to show here is, is an acceptable route. It's to do with the maximum distance between directs on a route. But from a practical point of view, what will tend to happen is once you've taken off, Scottish will talk to Icelandic and Icelandic will probably clear you direct to Rosti. So you'll find you've taken off and you're pretty much climbing to whatever your cruise is and flying direct to Rosti, which is on the edge of the Iceland CTA. Um, there are a couple of other common routing points, um, but again, you'll, you'll find them on the charts. Um, this particular routing is a favorite of mine because as you can see, it's not like some contorted IFR routes, it's pretty much direct. And what actually happens routing you direct to Rosti is, is um, is pretty much the norm. I don't think I've ever been forced to follow these routes. It is worth noting though, that um, air traffic controllers on both sides of the divide are very interested in knowing when you cross 10 west. Um, and you see here this point, 62 north, 10 west. 10 west also marks the start of the transatlantic track system, which you can just about see in the box, sort of at the bottom left of this. In fact, the little dagger, dagger shaped picture is a, uh, an aircraft that was flying the track system at the time I took the snapshot of my screen. Um, so you need to know if you're not familiar with it, how to program points into your GPS navigator that are actual lat longs. It's surprising how that particular snippet of information is often elusive if you're used to routing around Europe between named waypoints, or worse still, you're used to using your finger on a pad to draw between two points. You need to have these nailed because they do route people strictly to these points. And again, outside the scope for tonight, but when you do the crossing to Greenland and you cross a number of, of um, lines of longitude, you are expected to route quite strictly to these lines of longitude and provide position and estimate reports on them. So that's there, it's almost never used, but it's a mandatory requirement for the flight plan when you file it there. And you will find yourself sometimes requested to give a direct, sorry, to give an estimate for 10 West 
which is really good if they actually let you fly the flight plan. But if you've just been given a direct, you're busy celebrating your direct, only then to find that you've lost your waypoint for when you crossed in west, and you need to then figure it all out again. Um, so this is the IFR routing. As you can see, 641 nautical miles. That's a point-to-point -point distance, not counting for maneuvering for approaches or anything of that sort. So easily call it 650 nautical miles. In my PA32, that's five hours, 48 minutes, based on what a typical 30 knot headwind at IFR cruising levels. So it's worth, once again, thinking about how you stage this crossing if you're planning on doing it. If you're in an aircraft with a lower capacity um, or where this would put you in to problems, um, potentially crossing to the Faroes and stomaching the turbulence there is a good thing. Um, on the other hand, if you've got the distance or you're prepared to divert to Hoffen, say, um, which is only slightly to the east of the ING beacon that you can see there, um, then that may be another route of getting around it. The distance between Hoffen and Reykjavik is a good hour or so's flying time, so you, you, you've got options. Um, and the weather in Hoffen is frequently different to the weather in Keflavik and Reykjavik. So once again, if you end up getting all the way to Iceland, but Reykjavik and Keflavik go under, Hoffen is a great place to think of, both from a fuel divert point of view, as well as from a weather divert point of view. But when you, sometimes when you see the distances like that, it's, um, it can be off-putting, but it's worth putting them there because you can see what your options are. So when you get to Reykjavik, this is a picture separated by a few years. Two of my aircraft from the same hotel um, are parked at the same handling agent. So the top left picture is my TB20. Um, the shack to the left-hand side is the handling agent known as ACE FBO. They've changed their names. They used to be called Flight Services a few years ago, but they're now ACE FBO. And uh, then more recently, you can see Delta Whiskey parked facing the opposite direction, but in broadly the same distance. Um, and you can see the ramp there, you know, looks like a Global Express and a Falcon sharing the ramp with me in the, uh, in the lower picture. And you can see once again here, the airport in the right-hand side of the picture there, typically slightly hazy day there. I think that photo was taken around April, so this kind of time of year. So you can see the airport, you can see quite how much in the town centre it is. And um, the, what you're looking at on that same island is, is effectively Reykjavik spread out in front of you. I think this was actually on the departure to Greenland. I shot this particular photo. Um, nice long runways, ILS is in on both of the main runways, RNP approaches as well. And for real, real diehard instrument pilots, they've even got NDB DME approaches as well. So there's something for everybody there. The approaches to the airport are relatively flat, actually, save for the buildings. The tallest building in Reykjavik is the um, cathedral itself, um, which I have, I think, omitted. I may have much one on a later slide here. But this is Reykjavik. Um, Lovely place to go. A handling agent charges 158 euros for a Piper Lance. Um, and if you are doing the Atlantic thing, they charge it both ways. You're not getting away with 158 covering your coming back as well. Um, but for that, um, you do get superb service. They know all the tricks, of course, in terms of advising people across the Atlantic in both directions. They know the preferred routings. Um, they can work miracles in terms of um, getting flight plans filed at short notice. They provide fuel, which on Iceland starts to be the start of cheap avgas. As you're working your way around the Atlantic, the Scots are very keen on charging premium prices for their avgas, particularly the closer you get to making an Atlantic hop. When you get to Vegar, they know that uh, you probably need fuel and they know how to charge for it too. Um, you're looking at prices easily around the sort of what would it be? Probably all taxes paid, closing in on three uh, euros per litre there. So enough to make you pause for thought. Iceland, it starts to come back more to UK prices, if not below. Um, and in fact, uh, Greenland is a temporary bump before landing in Canada, where the fuel prices are much more what you'd expect in America, where you're probably paying around half of what we're paying for our gas at the moment. Um, so yes, it's an expensive landing. Um, in fact, technically, it's a very it's a very cheap landing. Landings and takeoffs are free 
in Reykjavik. The only thing you're actually paying for is the handling, but the handling is mandatory. So make of that what you will. Um, but they're a great bunch of guys. They're all pilots themselves. They've also good mates with the flying club. So if you do land and you feel like hiring a 172, they can sort that out for you. And uh, it tends to be that pilots interested in hiring the local aircraft. If you've approached and you've been sensible in your own aircraft all the way from the UK, then whilst they will still check you out, you will uh, avoid the basic lessons in how to learn to fly. They will probably trust you having got that far. Um, so that's Reykjavik. Moving swiftly on to Hoffen. So this is my, my recommended bolt hole for aircraft that don't have the range. You can see it really is um, little more actually than the, not quite a shack, I'm being rude about the terminal building, but it's kind of a shack um, with a runway. And the runway is actually very unusual if you're not used to flying in and around the Arctic Circle. And that is that it's made out of crushed basalt nothing else, just crushed basalt that's been rolled very hard into the ground. So actually, if you walk onto the runway, you can pick up pieces of basalt, probably a centimetre or two along. And for that reason, you don't do your power checks on the runway, you do your power checks on the ramp, which are rather more conventional tarmac. And you're advised to release the brakes as you apply power to avoid chipping your prop or any of the sort of damage that comes from using runways of that sort. The reason the runway is made that way um, is that this is a fairly remote part of Iceland and um, they just can't afford to keep repairing the tarmac in the way that they do at the larger airports. So the advantage of this crushed basalt is actually the, um, the, the runway can, can be savaged by ice, water, snow and all the rest of it and it doesn't destroy the surface. And actually even under those conditions the grip on the surface is really quite good as you can imagine. So there's a technique to flying on it. You need to be careful, um, but, but being aware that that's the surface is good to know about, because again, it, it, going in forewarned is forearmed. There is a um, localizer DME approach, and there's also an RNP approach onto both directions. Um, localizer DME approach has minima around the 500 foot mark. The um, uh, RNP approaches are closer to sort of 350 mark. Um, but actually that, that corner of Iceland is often pretty good from a weather point of view. Um, it's interesting if you as an exercise look up from time to time the TAFs and METARs for, for Bravo India Hotel November, rarely does it suffer the kind of fog and low cloud that you tend to associate with Reykjavik and Keflavik. So never say never, but it's, it's not a bad place to go. You'll see things that it's missing you might like. It's got quite rudimentary runway lighting that the intensity doesn't come up much higher than you can see there. It's got pappies in both directions, which are great for the instrument approach, but it doesn't look like an instrument approach runway. There are no touchdown markers, for example, um, and there are no approach lights to it. So it's that kind of thing which governs the, relatively speaking, higher minima. Um, but a great place nonetheless. It also has about five miles up the road, the only hotel in that part of Iceland, which has, I think, about 15 rooms. And when I last went in there, I stayed with a few friends. We were the only guests and it was a little bit like, you know, we walked into the hotel and the piano music stopped and the locals looked at us and we sat down and they uh, asked us what we wanted. We booked into our rooms and uh, we asked for beer, no problem at all. And one of us hit on the idea that it would be really good if we had some peanuts or something of that sort to have with a beer. So we asked the girl behind the bar, do you have anything to eat like peanuts or something of that sort? Ah, oh, peanuts, no problem. And she went away. And about 10 minutes later, we saw the same girl on a moped driving away into the distance to where there appeared to be nothing at all apart from a large glacier. And about half an hour later, the moped reappeared and she turned up with a bag of peanuts. Um, it's um, so few guests, so infrequently that the idea you might have peanuts with your beer just never occurred to them, but nothing is too much trouble. So we had this rather surreal experience of feeling that we had to eat all the peanuts because um, she'd gone to such trouble to get them. But um, great place, as you can see, looking at the view out of the dining room there, a lovely hotel, really highly recommended. And um, again, happy to pass details to anybody that's contemplating doing the route. Because it is so poorly booked, it's difficult to see how it manages to keep life and soul together. It is part of a pan-Iceland chain. So I imagine there's a degree of sort of lost leading here. Hotel rooms in Iceland are extremely expensive, a word to the wise. Um, even a very modest hotel can cost you 150, 200 pounds a night. Um, 
with the very posh hotels costing even more. Um, there is a good line, however, in Airbnb and similar. Um, and so a top tip if you're planning on going there, particularly with family, um, whether or not you're flying, I would consider looking at Airbnb and similar sorts of arrangements because the prices are much more in line with what you might hope for there. So that is Hoffen, I think correctly pronounced Hoffen. This is Akirabi, the one in the north that I referred to earlier. You can see very different kettle of fish altogether, conventional runway, you can see it's an instrument runway. Um, ILS is in both directions, RNP, nice low minima. Um, approach is not totally clear, you can't really see it there, but it's in, it's in sort of a valley in an inlet. Um, yet another Vic. Um, really interesting in its own right, though. There's a museum of Icelandic history there, there's a beer museum for those who might be interested in sampling what, fair, what uh, Icelandic beer might have tasted like over the years. Um, the local beer is called Gull, which means gold in Icelandic. So a lot of Gull things in, in Iceland. Akureyri is definitely the place to, to try them out. As you can probably see, Akureyri is also blessed with both internal and external air service. The uh, 757-300 you can see there uh, with Iceland Air is part of a service that links uh, Akureyri to Northern Canada and to Greenland as well. Um, and from time to time, particularly during the summer, into UK destinations as well. We'll see how much of that has survived the experience. You'll see in the bottom left of the frame, though, it's also home for the Icelandic Air Museum. So if you've managed to persuade your loved ones to accompany you on this trip, what better than to bore them with a trip around an aviation museum? And Akureyri is the place to go for that, um, for that experience for them. They may choose to do almost anything else, but it is actually worthwhile going around. Um, and you can see by all the TF registrations there, it really is a, a history of aviation in Iceland, which has its origins back to 1940 when the uh, Royal Engineers built the runway there, as we talked about earlier. So that's Akureyri, and you can see why I'm saying it's such a good bolt hole. If you end up there, you don't regret it. It's not like Hoffen, where there really is nothing to do. You arrive in Akureyri, and it, it's a proper little town. Um, worth saying, actually, as a matter of, uh, of interest, Population of, of ferries, I said, is 55,000 and declining slightly. Population of the whole of Iceland is only 350,000 in round numbers. So when I talk about big towns, we're not really talking big towns. We're talking about places with a population maybe barely in excess of 10,000. And you can pretty much see all of Akureyri on the overshoot to the runway there. You can also see the obligatory cruise ship. You can't get away from them wherever you go. Um, which takes me uh, to where, where to go and what to see. Um, the waterfall you can see here is called Gull Foss. Everything is gull. Golden Falls. Foss is falls. Gull Foss is golden falls. This is um, one of many, many waterfalls in Iceland, but is perhaps the most picturesque. And you can see it's kind of a compound of multiple falls altogether. There's even a romantic story about a, a lady whose lover spurned her and she threw herself into the falls and there's an effigy of her by the path that you can see going down to the waters there. So it's got absolutely everything. It's on something called the Golden Circle, which is a sort of recommended tourist route around the centre of Iceland, which encompasses these falls, but also places like Geysir, the origin of Giza, where in other words, lots of blowholes in the ground that you can see. So this, a couple of other sets of waterfalls, the, the hot geysers um, and a number of volcanic craters are all on that tour and very much part of the sort of de rigueur route. Iceland has two kinds of roads. There are sort of main roads that are unrecognizable or, or rather that are, un, that are not in any way different from, from ours. But there are a large number of roads which are also made of compressed basalt, um, which you really need a four by four to navigate at many times of year. And in fact, so much so that it's actually illegal to take conventional cars onto them and there's copious road signage around that effect. So um, if you're planning on going off beast for yourself, get a, get a four by four, don't get yourself a conventional car and enjoy some of those less easy to find routes off. Alternatively, by all means, go by plane. Um, and I'll come onto that in a second. So the two other things you're seeing there, whale watching, Everywhere in the Arctic Circle and beyond, 
um, encourages you to whale watch. And uh, you really, really do get this close. This is a, a genuine one of mine. Um, but uh, you'll find every tourist that's ever gone there has seen whales at this kind of proximity. It's not like the kind of disappointing experiences I used to have when I lived in Boston, where you'd go whale watching for two or three hours and not spot one. You pretty much always see them. Um, so very well worth seeing plenty of different types of whale for those that are really into this kind of thing. And as promised below, this is the tallest building in Reykjavik. This is the main cathedral there. Um, well worth a trip around in its own right, rather unusual architecture. And um, for those interested in ecclesiastical buildings, definitely worth the trip. That takes me to this on the right, the Giza. There are two of them, which is fantastic because you can con yourself into believing you speak Icelandic because they have little plaques next to them. This is the big one of the two Gizas, and it's called Bigger Giza, B I G R Giza. And surprise, surprise, there's another one almost next to it, and that's called Littler Giza, L I T L R Giza. It turns out bigger and littler are Icelandic for guess what? Big and little. So that's the big one. Blows remarkably frequently. You, you every what would I say, every three or four minutes. Um, and as you can see by the photo, you really can get extremely close to it. Um, well worth the trip. Um, and uh, it's actually right across the way from Gulf Foss. So you can actually get out of your car, go to Gulf Foss. 10 minutes later, you can be standing where this photo is taken from. Photo on the left requires a little more explanation. That is an airport. That is Gazier Airport. And you're probably scratching your head thinking, OK, where's the runway? And the good news is you're looking at it. Um, the slope and the muddy puddle in the middle of it all included. Um, and that's where I took my borrowed 172 because I wasn't going to take my aircraft there. Um, but it's absolutely wonderful. I mean, appearances are deceptive. It's about 700 metres there. Um, but as you can see, you want to land in one particular direction, you probably want to take off in the other. Um, the winds do help you somewhat with that. The buildings are a bit close to the climb out. Um, it does, does require a little bit of care. But this is what rural airstrips look like in Iceland, and there's probably 40 or 50 of them, all with IKO identifiers for the most part. Um, and there are local guides, the equivalent of a sort of Pooley's guide, which you can use to go and hunt them down. And they are very conveniently located right next to some of these obvious tourist attractions. So I thoroughly recommend, no matter by what means you go to Iceland, if you're a pilot, um, hire a plane. They're not particularly expensive. And there's a load of places you can see which will enhance your logbook, let's put it that way, if not enhance your flying expertise as well. Which takes us to my penultimate slide. Other things you can do in Iceland. So. Um, I've not really touched on it, but an enormous part of the surface of inner Iceland is glacier. Um, they are declining. There is the unmistakable effects of global warming are taking their toll, but they are still huge. Vatnajökull is the largest of them. It's just north of Hofn. Hofn is actually quite a good place to land if you are going to explore that glacier. And the preferred way of exploring them, at least for lazy people like me, is a snowmobile. Um, because you can get yourself an expert driver who will plonk you in the back and take you to all the sites. And believe me, the sites are quite incredible. So I uh, thoroughly recommend a snowmobile outing. Again, not particularly expensive. Um, plenty of competitive firms there keep the prices down. But again, wrap up warm, but it's an absolutely unforgettable experience. And because they do call Iceland the land of fire and ice, it wouldn't be complete without this sort of eruption that you can see. Um, and I think that photo is taken from pretty much as close as you would imagine. That's hot lava that's come out of that hole. Um, unlike what you tend to associate with volcanoes, it kind of dribbles out continuously. Um, so you go back two weeks later and the shape of the surface has changed slightly. But this is these sort of things are present all over Iceland. Pick one that's near where you want to go and go and see it. And once again, it's a, it's a lovely way of, of seeing, seeing the scenes. Also not to be missed, um, the largest volcano on Iceland is called Hekla. And it's almost right in the center geographically of Iceland. Perfectly acceptable to go VFR circling around the crater. In fact, it's a very popular little outing um, for people who sort of book a plane for the day. Um, it's one that again <laughs> varies depending on the eruption state. 
uh, occasionally it can be covered in a thick sulfurous cloud, but most of the time it isn't. And uh, flying around the top, you'll get a report from the uh, air traffic control and also from the flying club as to whether it's reasonable to do it on the particular day you want to do it. I do recommend going and having a look down a volcano. Um, again, quite an unforgettable experience and something that's difficult to achieve in Norfolk. And then last, but by no means least, is the picture of this rather attractive woman who unfortunately I don't know, um, um, standing in this beautiful blue water. One of the um, features of Greenland, uh, sorry, of Iceland rather, is that a lot of their power is generated by virtue of geothermal energy. In other words, they, they uh, use the heat that's coming out of the ground to boil water and use that to drive turbines, which leaves the problem, what do you do with all that hot water that you no longer have need for? And the answer is they pump it out into big pools like this, which are, as you can see, extremely warm at all times of the year, smell slightly of, of uh, sulfur and are covered in silica and other forms of byproduct um, which people swear is wonderful whether you've got eczema or bad back psoriasis or any other condition highly recommended um, people go to some of the bigger lagoons this one is the blue lagoon which is about halfway between Reykjavik and Keflavik and they can hang out there all day there's there's health food restaurants there um, you can pop in and out as much as you like and um, once you're in, believe me, particularly if it's the winter, you don't want to come out. So people do tend to go in there, have several attempts at getting out and then decide actually it's way too cold and they stay there for the rest of the day. It's um, one of those must do sort of places for your trip. So I hope I've inspired you. That takes me to my final slide. I apologize if I've ignored any questions on route because I can't actually see your hands raised while I still have the slides show up. But that's it from me. I'm really, really happy to take any questions. And I will unshare my uh, screen so I can see you all. Thank you so much, Nigel. That was so interesting. We had a few comments in the chat, but I think they all got answered themselves. So if, if anybody's got any questions and they want to pop their hands up, um, then we'd be uh, very pleased to spotlight you and hear your thoughts. If you can either put your hand up um, electronically. I see. Or... Is it Neil, your yeah. hand up? You're on mute, I think. Yes, thank you. Oh, uh, okay. No, it was just a thumbs up, actually, just to say I was just saying thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, I had about seven yeah. questions, which I think you've all answered. So uh, well, that's, that's good news. Thank you. Great stuff. I'll uh, I'll see to the floor. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. I've got a oh a question from Ian, but that's gone. A little hand up, but that's gone. I think you've done such a good job, Nigel, that we don't have any questions. Oh, oh, question, oh Megan, there I we go. Go on, Chris. It's fine. We can hear you. Is. Silly technology. <laughs> we can hear you. Um, yes, yeah, so I've heard that if you fly the North Atlantic to be covered by insurance, the first time you have to take an experienced pilot with you or go with a professional ferry pilot, is that correct? And does that apply to the Iceland? Does that apply to ferries? Oh, by so, the way, it's a brilliant talk. I absolutely loved it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, short answer in relation to everything we've talked about tonight, um, you do not need typically any special insurance, or, and there are no constraints relating to having to take a ferry pilot or anything of that sort with you. Do check your insurance, um, but ordinarily there are no conditions and you'll find that certainly I, I cited VisiCover that I'm currently with, but um, I, it's been the case historically when I've been with Haywoods and others that there's been no particular terms and in fact is even part of the standard default coverage, but do check clearly. Um, in terms of going beyond Iceland, though, that is where you tend to run into um, special constraints. And typically, um, it's a little bit like getting an equity card. You can't get an equity card unless you've done a job that qualifies. And you can't get a job that qualifies unless you've got an equity card. So it's kind of a catch-22. So typically, if you are going to go beyond to Greenland and into Canada, you'll need um, additional coverage. And one of, the, one of the terms typically of that coverage would be that you carry someone that's made similar piston crossings before. It's not a question of getting yourself a A380 captain or whatever. You need someone that's typically flown piston and therefore is familiar with the, uh, with the challenge. The uh, Canadians in particular are quite hot on expertise. And there was a time 
when I think they have a little more time on their hands if you would suffer an interview before you actually set off back from Canada. And unless you were instrument rated, they wouldn't let you go. Those days are gone, but um, they still strongly advocate an instrument rating. Um, but of course, by the time you've got there from Greenland, it's a little late for them to, to have that conversation with you. But um, from an insurance point of view, you're absolutely right. The rumor is still true. And unless you really are packing thousands of hours with with plenty of relevant IFR experience, I suspect that would be your that would be your situation. Great, thank you. We've got one in the chat for VFR pilots. What's the best time for you to plan a trip to maximise your chances of VFR conditions? I think um, going both to from Faroes and to Iceland. I think uh, any time from around June onwards. Um, through to about back end of August. Um, once you get to September and beyond, it starts to go downhill again. And likewise, around now, you saw my utterly unedited TAF and META. Those sort of conditions are fairly typical. Um, so you, you can do it in March and April, but doing it VFR, your, your chances are going to be much better around the sort of June, July, August time. So it's a little bit restrictive, but, um, but that, that's probably what you're looking at. Great stuff. Any more questions? Anyone? Is that Adrian? Have you got a question? Gonna wait on mute. There we go. Hello there. Do they hello there? Um I'm wondering, does do they charge to actually keep the aeroplane overnight on the airfields, or is it just a handling charge to get in? Um in Reykjavik, the um the, the 158 that I quoted covered a couple of overnight stays. But there was no premium charge for that. It was a handling charge because, once again, the airport doesn't charge either a landing fee or a parking charge per se. And the handlers, I think, have, yeah, bore out of years of probably not wanting to force people reluctantly into the air. You can imagine the pressure that a mounting landing fee might place on somebody. I think the kind of ethos of you've paid your fee within reason, you can stay as long as you need to go to where you're going to go to seems to be the way it works. And, uh, so you could so you could quite easily say go into Hoffen or one of the others, and then just tour around Iceland. And once you've actually got there, once you've got there, it's not actually too bad. It's just the accommodation and food and beer, which yes. is the expensive bit. So so mineral water is definitely the way to go, and that way you can you can save up for handling fees at Reykjavik. But yeah, you know, literally that that's it. And in terms of food food in in Iceland. Certainly, if you go to um, Reykjavik itself, the choice of restaurants is is what you'd expect in almost any other developed city. You know, if you have a hankering for McDonald's, even even Iceland succumbed to McDonald's a couple of years ago, having previously kicked them out. Um, but there are steak restaurants, if that's your kind of thing, or you can go rather more traditional, which is very much of the fish and whale blubber variety. Has to be done at least once, but I think you might well come back to the steak after that. Um, but again, so, right. so I guess going, so I guess going from the UK, you need to go from a customs airfield. So you could the quickest route would be going either up to Kirkwall, but the fuel's expensive in Kirkwall. I've been to Kirkwall, or yeah. you could and Scats, Scats does now shut. So, but the other way of doing it is to go from um, say from Wick, isn't it, or from yes. somewhere else, Glasgow, for example. So, so I, I think Wick over Glasgow only because again, in track miles terms, um, Wick gives you a slightly cleaner getaway. If you go IFR, then it's a rather cleaner join. Um, and the pricing for landings and fuel at Wick is quite keen. So far north, the people I mentioned in the context of survival suits have the fuel concession there. And um, they will quite literally have you in and out of Wick in half an hour um, for the fuel. Yeah. It's, it's a very, very slick operation. And in fact, if you have, for example, pre-booked survival gear, Killing two birds with one stone, getting your aircraft fueled, filing your flight plans, and getting your life gear on um, is all part of the service. So they they really are extremely good. Um, and Far North Aviation, if you look at their website, cover all the details of the services they offer. Mm -hmm. So I think if if you find yourself very tight on mileage, then you might go for Kirkwall and suffer the cost of the extra fuel. Um, I go for Wick, but I'm I'm perhaps less mileage constrained than if I were in a one seven two. So you pay some money and takes a choice, I think. Wicks, Wicks are a really, really good place to go for, and I, I don't want to sound like an advert for them, but Far North have been doing this for years, and they do they do, do it very well. That brings us really nicely... Go... Sorry. 
No, no go ahead. I'm, sure. Wanna, it brings us on to a question know. that's in the chat about um, the other safety equipment that you would recommend for water crossings. Would you take a sat phone or an ELT and, and what advice have you got there? Yes. So um, I, I think, again, taking us beyond Iceland, things like a sat phone um, iridium service is definitely worthwhile. Going to Iceland, you're not outside radio contact, even at flight level 54, um, albeit Iceland radio rather than necessarily a controlling service. But actually, the same is true for IFR flights as well. So um, I don't know that I would necessarily go for a sat phone specifically for Iceland, but if continuing on through Greenland, definitely. Um, and although it isn't officially sanctioned as an alternative to HF, um, practically, a lot of people that are not HF equipped will use a sat phone to radio in position reports and similar. Um, so definitely worthwhile, but not necessary as far as Iceland is concerned. The only, the only reason you might carry one, I guess, is for the total electrical failure and other sorts of concerns that might might bug you. But even these days with a um, combination of a couple of fully charged iPads and a battery backup and uh, uh, and the sat phone, you really are covered even against that kind of eventuality. Worth saying, actually, it just occurs to me, responding to the question earlier about what time of year might work best for VMC VFR pilots. Another feature of going at that time of year, which I've not mentioned at all, is that it simply doesn't get dark in Iceland in June, July time. Um, it kind of goes dingy for a few minutes and then goes light again. Um, and for those who have not experienced this, it's quite curious. When you book into your hotel, you'll find that every single one of them has blackout curtains because the only way you can get to sleep is by blacking the room out in the, in the summer. Corollary is, of course, that um, if you go in January, it doesn't really get light. It kind of goes dingy briefly and then goes dark again. So another reason for picking the sort of, let's call it June, July, August time, is that you really are getting the most VFR daylight hours you possibly could benefit from. And... The airport at Reykjavik is open 24 7, which is more meaningful if it doesn't really get dark very much. So uh, you've got plenty of options in terms of flight hours and times of day and giving yourself options in terms of when you depart the UK to get there. So lots of thoughts of that sort that you wouldn't necessarily perhaps think of first off. Also worth noting that both the Faroes and uh, Iceland are permanently on GMT. They simply never change the clocks. So again, in terms of planning and all the usual tri tricky, tricky issues you have going around the Atlantic of wondering which time zone you're in, going to going oh. to the Faroes in Iceland is dead easy. You're always in GMT. Nice. Great stuff. Uh, I don't think we've got any more questions. So I'll hand over to Terry just to close the meeting. Well, in which case, I'll close by saying a really big thank you Nigel, that was absolutely fabulous. It was entertaining, informative, and fascinating from the very beginning to the very end. Um, that's the second time you've talked to us during this winter program, and both talks have been fantastic. I guess a lot what? We'd like you to come back next winter, please, to give a talk, and you can guess what the subject is. It will be Greenland and beyond, please, Nigel. But I can do you that. You've given us a tour de force. It's been a fabulous evening. And on behalf of all of us from the Cambridge Era Club, all of our friends and guests who have joined us this evening, you've had a capacity audience and we just cannot thank you enough. There is a bottle of something in my, in my office for you and I look forward to handing it over when the moment is right. But Nigel, from us all, thanks a million. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was a wonderful attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really good. Great stuff.